Good morning. What a lovely group we have here this morning in person, and I'm sure you're just as lovely at home watching online. Thank you for being here in Hollybrook Baptist Church. What a great day it is when we can uh, start our service with a baptism. We have Tori Williamson coming. Tori? This is Tori Williamson, and uh, I've told you all about her in a message a few weeks ago. Tori and her husband, Joe, have, uh, Joe's been coming for over a year, and since uh, COVID-19 started, they were watching our service online, and through watching online, and because of the example of Joe, Tori has prayed to receive Christ as her Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. If you are a friend of or family member of Tories, would you stand and let us recognize you? We've got some up front and in the back and all over the auditorium. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Tori, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? He is. She said, I know he is. Then I'll ask you to turn this away and have a seat. And then it is my privilege to Tori to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and thank you for the witness that Tori has given us this morning of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And perhaps there's someone either online or even sitting here this morning that has never trusted in Jesus. I pray that today is the day. We love you, Lord. And we thank you for our Savior, Jesus. In his great name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. My name's Tori as well. It's a good name. Uh, I want to welcome all the visitors, see some new faces out there. We are so excited y'all chose to come worship with us this morning. And uh, to show our appreciation for you after the service, if you would just pop by the Welcome Center, we've got a free gift for you. And we would just like to personally meet you and just, um, we're just so grateful you're with us today. We've got a couple announcements for you all. Choir will be at 8, or I'm sorry, 6.15 on Wednesday. I've got that right, correct? correct? Yep. Okay, choir at 6.15 on Wednesday in the choir room or in here? Okay, in here. So if you're interested in maybe joining the choir, maybe it's something you've always wanted to do, come join us. Jason, I'm sure, would love to have you. All right, also, exciting news. We are starting a, I don't know, maybe for lack of better terms, a young ladies Bible study. We're going to be starting that next week. Um, really excited about that. Uh, Connie LaFleur has graciously offered to lead that for us. Uh, so that's going to be a young ladies Bible study at 930. So that'll be during the first service, 930. And then y'all can go to the 11 o'clock after that. Uh, also with, with that comes our two services. We're so excited that we're going back to two services next week. So October 4th. Uh, at 9.30, we will have the, um, we're calling it a blended service. Uh, your music is going to be a little bit more blended. And then at the 11 o'clock service, you'll get more of, uh, more of uh, modern. We're calling it our modern service. So anyways, that, mark your calendars, October 4th next week, back to two services. We will continue to live stream the services. I know some people were concerned about that. No worries. From here on out, we're live streaming the 11 o'clock service. So that will uh, always, always be happening. And last on my list is the fall festival. We are planning on doing the fall festival. It will look a little bit different because of the unknown with COVID and all of this. Um, and with us getting into kind of more flu season here soon. Um, we're going to actually do it this year in the parking lot so we can really spread out. And uh, we have a lot of people who made us games over the last couple of years. So we have all of those games available. So what we're asking in the Welcome Center, there are sign-up sheets. And if you are able to, maybe you and a friend or you and your spouse or you and your kids, whatever you want to do, uh, we're asking people to kind of host, we're calling it a station. So basically it would be your, your car, you would have a game, we have the games, so you don't even have to come up with the game, you just gotta bring your car, grab the game, we will have candy as well, you implement the game, and as the kids come from each station to station, they can play your game, give them candy. Uh, so it's going to be kind of similar to what we used to do in the gym. We're just moving it outside. Our rain plan is if 
we're praying for no rain, first of all. But if it rains, we will be in the gym, no games. Everybody will spread six to 10 feet apart and kids will come in one door. They'll get their can at each of your stations and they'll go out another door. So it won't be as fun because we won't have the games, but at least we won't, uh, the candy won't go to waste and we'll still get to minister to our community. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me. Like I said, there's a sign up out in the, out in the welcome center. Is there a slideshow? Did that get put in? Do you know? Okay. Um, I put together a couple examples, but all you need to do is Google trunk or treat ideas. Uh, you can decorate your cars. I mean, even just cut out some big googly eyes on a sheet of, on a sheet of paper computer paper. You can stick them on your trunk. If you Google trunk or treat, you will be blown away at some of the fun ideas that you can decorate uh, your trunks with if you so desire. So like I said, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask me. Thank you. Let's worship. Good morning, church. Let's stand together as we sing. Open the eyes of my heart. Thou in me 
Scripture reading this morning is found in James chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? And all knowing he counts not their sum Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore Our sins they are many, his mercy is more What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. thankful for that today what a riches of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood with the dead he could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more stronger darkness through every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness through every morn our sins they are many Since they are many, his mercy is more. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to care.
despise for Lamb of God, worthy is your name. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, precious Lamb. your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all sing that chorus one more time, just our voices. Jesus, precious Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, holy Lamb of God, worthy Lord, I worship your 
worship your holy name Lord I worship your holy name my Jesus I love thee I know thou art mine for thee all the follies of sin I resign my gracious redeemer my sin sing praises to your name today. Worthy, worthy is your name, Lord. Thank you for this day. Just send a fresh anointing over this church this morning, Lord. Be with Brother David as he brings the word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's a pretty accurate and powerful description of Ephesians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn there, we come to the end of our series, Ready for Battle. And we've been talking about for the last several weeks that we as Christians are in a spiritual battle. We are in a war. The war that we are in are with three different enemies. We are at war with our own flesh. We are at war with the world around us, the world system that we live in, and we are at war, war with Satan himself. And today we come to the end of our series. We've been talking over the last six weeks, each of the different pieces of armor that God has given us to protect us during this war. 
And we've learned that the war, it's the, the armor itself identifies the virtues that they uh, are tied with. We talk about the breastplate of truth and the virtue of truth and the uh, the uh, the breastplate of the belt of truth, uh, excuse me, and the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of the gospel of peace. We've talked about the shield of faith and, of course, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And each of these are virtues in the Christian's life. And what Paul is telling us here today and throughout our passage this morning, in order to, uh, for us to stand, because that's what he tells us to do, he tells us to stand to, to stand firm. And in order for us to stand firm, we must suit up with this armor these virtues that he's talking about. And then at the beginning of the message and at the end of the scripture that we're going to read this morning, we will see that he tells us to do it in prayer. He tells us that it is prayer that is the power behind the armor that we put on on an everyday basis. But unfortunately, most Christians don't understand that. Most of us don't understand that it is, was, it is the power of prayer behind the armor that gives us the power to defeat Satan, to defeat the world system, and to defeat our own flesh. And too often what we do with prayer is we turn it into a help me thing. You know, dear God, help me. Dear God, help, uh, heal me. Dear God, uh, uh, give me. When in all reality, on a daily basis, we need to be saying, dear God, Give me strength. Dear God, use me. Dear God, make me the warrior that you want me to be in this spiritual battle that we're in. On September 17th, 2009, Reverend Kevin Fast, who is a Lutheran pastor, that's him right there. Um, I'm glad he's not my pastor because he could crush me like a walnut, it looks like, right? He is a strongman competitor. He is a Christian pastor in the Lutheran denomination, and he is now the man who has set the world record for pulling an airplane, the heaviest airplane of all time. It is a CC-177 plane. I guess that's the plane behind him. The CC-177 is the heaviest aircraft pulled by an individual. That plane weighs 416,299 pounds. That's 208 tons. And this man pulled it in one minute and 21 seconds for 30 feet. What an incredible feat of strength that this Lutheran pastor, Reverend Fast, has done to be able to pull 208 tons of steel that was never really supposed to get off the ground. He was pulling it was nothing but his bare strength. And as great as a feat as that is, it is nothing compared to those powerful engines that are mounted on that plane. Those engines can fly that plane 9,500 miles at an average speed of 550 miles per hour. So pulling at 30 feet in a minute and 21 seconds, as great a feat as that is, it is nothing compared with the power of those engines that can make those 208 tons get off the ground and fly around the world. And so it is with prayer. Just as impossible as a plane flying on its own power, neither can a Christian accomplish anything on his or her own power. It is only through the power of prayer that we are able to defeat Satan in the spiritual war that we're in. And if you have your Bibles, you can see there in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, we must pray to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Notice that it doesn't say that we are to pray that we are strong, that God gives us muscles like Reverend Fast. That's not what Paul is talking about here. What Paul is talking about is it doesn't matter how big or small how much you can bench press or deadlift. What matters is, are you a Christian who is on your knees on a daily basis? That's where our power and our strength comes from. It comes from our Lord. Beginning in verse 13, it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. 
Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's go to the word, the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you with humble hearts and we bow before your throne and in your presence. Father, I pray that as we talk about prayer today, that each of us would understand the importance of prayer in our daily lives. The importance of prayer that gives us the power to put on the belt of truth or the breastplate of righteousness or take up the shield of faith or the sword of the Spirit. And that, Father, through that power, we can extinguish the fiery darts of the devil. We thank you for our Jesus. And I pray, as Paul prays here, that we would have the ability to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So why is prayer so important? I mean, if you really think about it, I could probably spend the next three years talking about nothing but prayer from the pulpit. Did you know that? Maybe longer. I think prayer is really a limitless topic. It's something that we could talk about over and over again and never get tired of it. You just think about, we could talk for a year about all the things that we should be praying for. We could talk for a year about all the different kinds of prayers that there are. I mean, we could spend tons of time talking about prayer, but what does Paul say about prayer in our passage this morning? Because when we talk about prayer this morning, we have to do it within the context of Scripture. And here in Scripture, Paul is talking about prayer specifically in spiritual warfare. And so this morning, instead of taking prayer, and I know that I could spend hours and hours and hours preaching on prayer, we're only going to look at a few different things about prayer when it pertains to spiritual warfare. Y'all with me? So don't come afterwards and say, you could have said this about prayer. I know. I could have. And I might should have. But in the context of our passage this morning, let's look at prayer in spiritual warfare. First of all, we need prayer in order to stand against the devil. Right? That's what Paul tells us from the very beginning. The the command in our passage is put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That is what Paul has exhorted us to do. He has exhorted us to stand against the devil. We've talked about some of his schemes. We've talked about some of his strategies that Satan uses to distract us, to to take advantage of us, to get us off course. I mean, he is a wily devil, is he not? And he will do anything and everything in his power to make us fall away from God. If we attempt to fight Satan or our flesh, or the world system that we live in, if we try to do that under our own power and our might, guess what? We fell. And when we do, we fell miserably. And you ask me how I know that? Because I've done it. And you know what? You've done it too, haven't you? We have all, when those trials, when those tribulations, when those hard times come into your life, whether you've lost a job or heard the C word, or you know, it's cancer, or whatever the case may be, We always, if you're anything like me, uh, well, you know, buck up, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can do it, boy, you know. And, and, And we fail. And here's the problem is we know that we're going to fail and yet we do it anyway. And, and, and at the end of it, after we've tried and we failed to go through whatever the trial, whatever the tribulation, whatever the circumstance is, you know what we say to ourselves? Well, only thing we can do now is just go to the Lord in prayer. When we should have started there in the very first place, right? That's where we should have begun the trial, the tribulation, the circumstance, whatever the case may be. So we know that we're going to fail. Um, 
we've talked about some of these various schemes and strategies of Satan. What does he do? He accuses. He he says, "Uh, you're not good enough, are you? He deceives us. God didn't really say that, did he? He tries to tempt us. Go ahead. It's not going to hurt you. He does all of these things. And if we are going to stand, we must not only put on all of the pieces of armor, But then we have to back that armor with prayer so that we can stand against these schemes and strategies of the devil. We can't stand without prayer. The best way to stand is on your knees. Maybe some of you old timers um, remember this hymn. I found this hymn. It it was uh, during a Google search and I read the, the words of this hymn and I thought, you know, it fits so good. The hymn is called Christian Seek not yet repose. Anybody know that hymn? Okay, it's, it was written in the 1840s, so none of y'all were alive back then, were you? Okay. Can I read the hymn to you? It says, Christian, seek not yet repose. Hear the gracious Savior say, Thou art in the midst of foes. Watch and pray. Principalities and powers mustering their unseen array. Wait for thy unguarded hours. Watch and pray. Gird thy heavenly armor on. Wear it ever night and day. Ambush lies the evil one. Watch and pray. Pretty sound words, aren't they? I mean, that's exactly what Paul is telling us to do. It's good advice. We live in enemy-occupied territory. We are at war. And the best and only way for us to stand is on our knees in prayer. Now, Robbie read to us James chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn there. It'll be on the screen as well. But I want to show you something in James chapter 4 as it relates to prayer. It says in James chapter 4 verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Now, I think James is really clear right here. He's saying when we submit to God, we get closer to God. Yes? Yes? That's what he says. Now, if you look up that Greek word submit, it is hupotasso. Now, hupotasso is a great Greek word, and what it means is to be put in place. That's what the word hupotasso means, to put in place. And so that's what we do when we submit to God. We are put in place under him, under his protection, under his authority, under his provision. When we submit to God, we are under God, and therefore we draw near to God, and God draws near to us, and we are under his authority, under his strength, under his might, under his power. Isn't that a good place to be? And yet so many of us don't want to submit. I love children. I really do love children, but I've noticed something. The older I get, the less patient I have with children. Maybe some of y'all have gotten there. Uh, I, I, I think children are a wonderful gift of God. But when I see a child that is trying their parents, when, when, when I see a child that is disobeying mom or dad, when I see a child that does not submit, submit to the authority of the one in charge, that, that really irks me. Does it bother you too? See, when that child refuses to do what they are told or doesn't do what they are told, you know what it's called? It's called rebellion. And as a parent or a grandparent, we abhor rebellion, don't we? But the question is, do we detest, do we abhor rebellion in our own lives? See, we can look at someone else's children, maybe in our own children or grandchildren, and say, oh, you need to mind And I wonder if God looks at us and says, hey, you need to mind. You need to submit. You need to do what I tell you to do. Rebellion against God is a real serious matter, is it not? You think about it. The devil is the greatest rebel of all time, is he not? I mean, he rebelled himself right out of heaven. The devil is the greatest rebel of all time and his purpose is persuading God's children to join him in rebellion is it not if if Satan is rebelling and we are rebelling if the children of God are joining Satan in rebellion 
then we, right, just logically speaking, are rebelling against God ourselves. And when we are rebelling against God, who are we submitting to? Satan. And instead of being put in place by God, we've been put under Satan. We're under his control. We, we have drawn near to him instead of drawing near to God. As we submit ourselves then to God, as we draw near to God in prayer, guess what happens? The devil flees. And the only way for us to resist the devil then is by prayer. Prayer is the way we tap into God's protection. Prayer is the way that we get God's strength. Prayer is how we achieve God's power to resist and to stand against the devil. Prayer is very important. Now go back to Ephesians 6. Look in verse 17. It says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit. And we'll stop there. Now, the main verb in this sentence right here is the word take. So Paul is telling us to physically, to, to metaphorically take up the helmet and take up the sword. But what we see, if you're an English teacher or know anything about English, that word praying is a participle. And so when you take the verb take and you take the, the participle praying, what praying does is it modifies or it describes how we are to take up the sword and the helmet. And you know what he says? He says you take up the sword, you take up the helmet, you take up the whole armor of God while you are praying. That's how you take it up. And that's what Paul is telling us right here. And I've met folks, and maybe you're one of these folks, I've met folks that have told me that I pray on the armor of God every day. Well, that's good. That's great. I, I guess you get up out of bed and uh, you begin your prayer time and you metaphorically take up the belt of truth and you fasten it on and you put on the breastplate of righteousness and you put on the shoes of the gospel. That's great. And it's a great way to symbolically remember that you are to arm yourself with the armor of God on a daily basis. But that's really not the idea here. See, the idea here is that all these virtues, each of these pieces of armor, the, the things that they bring, the truth, the righteousness, the faith, the hope, see, they're put on by prayer. And so when we're praying on the armor of God, what we're doing is we're putting on righteousness and peace and faith and hope. And, and we can only do that and we can only wear them through prayer. See, if we stop praying, we lose hope. If we stop praying, we lose peace. If we stop praying, we lose faith, right? And so on and so forth. So it's important for us to pray on a daily basis. Uh, maybe I can explain it like this. There's all kinds of different watches out there. Uh, some of you have the old Timex watch where you have to wind it up, right? Yeah, y'all are all cheap, Okay. You can at least graduate to the battery watch, okay? It's only about $20 more, and you have to buy a battery every once in a while. But instead of winding up your watch to keep time to make it correct, guess what? I have a battery. It automatically does it. And then when my battery dies, guess what happens? I have to go buy a new battery because my watch won't be right. It'll stop running. It doesn't work correctly, right? And then there are the watches for you people that have lots of money. You have the watch where it, it works in, in motion. You know those watches that every time you move, it, it somehow winds the mechanisms in there and it keeps the time and it keeps on working. But what happens if you take that watch off and put it on a shelf for a time being and it's not in motion anymore, guess what? It loses time, doesn't it? It stops working correctly. Matter of fact, they make machines that you can put your watch on that constantly keeps it in motion. So it's always keeping time. And I would suggest for the Christian that prayer is like that machine that keeps the motion going in order for that watch to always be in time. And I would say prayer is like that for the Christian. It's something that we always, we always have to be in motion with God. We always have to be in communion with God in order to keep functioning properly, in order to keep the time to stay in constant motion. It energizes the armor that he has given us. When we are in constant communion with God, we operate then out of his strength and out of his might. 
That means we don't rely on ourselves, our knowledge. We don't rely on our bank account or our wisdom. We don't rely on anything or everything that we are. We rely solely and wholly on him. That's what prayer does for us. We stay strong in his power and in his might through constant prayer. Prayer places us close to God and the way we tap into his strength and the way that we get his might is to seek him, to humble ourselves before him. We have to acknowledge that we can do nothing on our own, that we need him in order to do it. If we don't pray, we won't have strength and if we aren't constantly seeking him, doesn't it stand to reason then that we are more apt to fall into temptation and sin? Sure it does. If I'm draw, drawing near to God, then what am I doing? I'm submitting and drawing near to the devil himself. And when I'm closer to the devil, I'm a lot more tempted and I'm a lot more uh, likely to sin and fall into that temptation. But when I stay near God, guess what? Those temptations don't hit me quite as hard. Look at verse 18. As I read this, I want you to count with me how many alls that we see here. He says, praying at all times, that's number one, in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. I counted four. How about you? I see four things that Paul is telling us to do in spiritual warfare when it comes to our prayer life. First of all, he tells us to pray at all times. We are to pray at all times. In Romans 12, 12, it tells us to be in constant prayer. And in Colossians 4, 2, it says, continue steadfastly in prayer. And of course, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says, pray without ceasing. In all of these instances, I don't think what the Bible is telling us that we should close our eyes and, you know, walk around, dear God, help me today. I don't think that's what he's talking about at all. I mean, we need to have those times. But the idea here is that we have these frequent conversations with God that our lives are then characterized by our prayer. If somebody that you just know superficially, if they had to describe you, would they describe you as a person of prayer? See, it means that we set aside daily even hourly, those times to pray. I, 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 th I think of it like this. If you and a loved one take a car trip, and maybe you have, you know, you're going to drive for the next six, eight, ten hours, whatever the case may be. You get everything packed, you get everything in the car, and you're both sitting in the car, and you go, okay, Okay, did we turn off all the lights? Did we set the alarm? Did we adjust the temperature on the air conditioner? Did we, did we? Okay, check, check, check. Okay, let's go. And now you hit the road. And you're on the road for a little while and you're talking about, oh, I'm so excited to get to our destination. I'm so excited to get to do this or that or such and such. And then there's this time of silence, right? I mean, husbands and wives... I guess it depends on your husband or your wife. But for the most part, you can sit in silence, can you not? And it's not an uncomfortable silence, is it? It's a comfortable silence. It's something that it's okay. It's okay to just sit there because you, you enjoy being in the presence of that person. And then when throughout that drive, you're on your trip and there's something, it, maybe God's put something in your mind or you see a road sign or if you're riding with Connie, she always says, well, I have to stop to go to the bathroom. Whatever the case may be, the silence is broken, right? And when that silence is broken, you, just, you can pick up the conversation and just carry on. There, there's, there's no break. There's no trying to, to make the conversation happy. And that's how it should be with God. That on a daily basis, I get up and I have this conversation with God. And guess what? Then there's this silence. 
And that silence is good because, you know, the same silence that I have with Connie in a car, we can have that silence because we have an intimate, personal relationship. And I can still have that same silence with God in my conversation with him. You know why? Because I have an intimate, personal relationship with him. And so that silence is good. And then something comes into my life. Maybe I'm reminded of a a sick friend. And you know what I do? I start the conversation up again. Hey, God, thanks for reminding me of so-and-so, and and I pray for their upcoming procedure. Or maybe I see something, and and it reminds me of my lost neighbor. God, thank you for my neighbor next door. I I pray for them, and that you would use me to, to show Christ in their lives. You see, that's how the prayer should be. And then you go back to that silence again. And then when something comes into your mind, something is happening, you guess what? You just pick up the conversation with ease because you have this intimate and personal relationship with the Lord. And the only way to have an intimate and personal relationship with your spouse or your friend or God himself is by spending time in communication with them. And that's what he's looking for. That's how we should live every day. Praying at all times means that we pray in bad times as well as the good times. We pray at all times. And then the next all that I see, he says that we should pray with all kind of prayers. Did you know that there's a lot of different kinds of prayers out there? I sometimes use the acronym ACTS. A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And I will follow that model. So when I'm praying, you know how I start my prayer? With adoration, with praise and worship of our Lord. And then I go to confession. That's a tough one for some of us, but I confess my sin. I confess my needs. I confess that I need him. And then I go to Thanksgiving. I tell him what I'm grateful for. I show him my gratitude. I say, thank you, God, for who you are, for what you've done and what you are doing in my life, in the life of my family, in the life of my church. And then I go to supplication. Did you notice that supplication, supplication means requesting something. And did you know all of my requests, and when I do this model acts, that it all comes at the end? That's pretty smart. And you know why? Because the time we get to supplication, we're through and we're tired of praying anyway. And so we keep our requests shorter at that point. And I don't see anything wrong with that. But we need to come, whether we're happy or sad, grateful or not, whether we have something weighing on our heart or we just need a friend, he says that we can come to him at any time. God doesn't move, only we move. And so we can come to him no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what your past is, doesn't matter anything, any of that stuff. We can come to God with all kinds of prayers. And then notice he says, pray with all perseverance. At a previous church, I had a deacon ask me the same question three or four times. And I don't know if that's bad that he asked the pastor the same question three or four times. Maybe he was looking for different answers. I don't know. But he would ask me, does it show how weak my faith is if I ask God for the same thing over and over again? That was his question. And I said, no, sir, absolutely not. If I look just in the Gospels, if I just look in the red letters, Jesus told us over and over again, didn't he? On the greatest sermon that was ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, what did Jesus tell us? To keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep on seeking, did he not? He said, keep going until you get your answer. So it's okay to persevere through your prayers. Just keep on going. And I think in Luke chapter 18, where Jesus is sitting there and he's talking to his disciples and he tells the disciples about the parable of the widow and the wicked judge. And what, uh, you know, Jesus tells the, the parable where the widow just kept pestering. She was persevere until she got the answer that she needed. And if you look at Luke chapter 18, verse one, Luke writes, and Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they, look at this, ought always to pray and not lose heart. We are to persevere in our prayers. Maybe you have a lost loved one that you've been praying for for 40 years. Don't stop. Persevere. 
Keep going until God gives you the answer. And then look at the last one. He says that we are to pray for all the saints, not just some of them. Listen, when I was at a church, uh, I, I had some people that uh, were not very happy with some things. Not this church, it was another church. And, and, and my, my first instinct is to fight back. You know what I'm talking about? My first instinct is to stand up and say, this is why. And you know what I learned through that? When I would stand up and when I fight the battle on my own, I lost every single time. And I finally learned through a few scars and bumps on the head, I don't need to stand up. God is there. He's fighting the battle for me. And you know what I did? Is I prayed for all saints, even the ones that didn't like me, especially the ones that didn't like me. And that's what we need to do. We need to pray for all the saints. And if you use this acronym, ACTS, uh, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication, it's an easy way to do that. I remember in seminary, I took Roy Fish, who was one of the greatest professors I've ever had, and he taught evangelism. And in that evangelism class, he, taught, he made us read Concentric Circles of Concern. And, and what that book is telling you and what it teaches is that in evangelism, the easiest and best place to start is with your immediate family. If you become a Christian, tell your immediate family. And then after you tell your immediate family, you tell your extended family. And then you tell your friends. And then you tell your neighbors. And then you tell your acquaintances. You see how these concentric circles work. And I thought about that. Why can't we do that with prayer? In that supplication time of prayer, we can pray for all the saints. And you know what? I start with my immediate family, the saints in my family, the Christians in my family, and then the Christians in my extended family, and then my Sunday school group, and then my small group, and then my church, and I pray for the church's needs, and I pray for the leadership of the church. You see how these concentric circles work? And that's how we pray for all saints the way I pray for you, matter of fact. I take my phone. I wish I would have brought it with me. I take my phone and I get our little app, our church directory app. If you don't have it on your phone, you should. It's the greatest tool on your phone. And I take that app out and I open that app up and I can see all of your smiling faces. Well, some of you are not smiling so much, but I can see you. And what I do with that app is I can go down the list and I can pray for you by name. That is praying for all saints. What a great tool and what a great thing to do. Now, I've said all of this about prayer. And if you're like me, you probably think, well, I don't pray enough. Or I don't pray for the right things. Or I don't pray with the right motive. Or I don't pray for the right reasons. I, I don't pray, I don't feel adequate to pray. Or I've strayed from God and he'll never listen to me now. Or maybe you've been praying for the same thing for, for years and God hasn't answered you. And you say, why should I pray? Because he doesn't answer. He doesn't talk to me. He, he never listens to me anyway. Maybe you're thinking that. But wherever you are on the prayer spectrum, whether you pray on a daily basis, an hourly basis, or you pray every once in a while, let me tell you, let me give you some encouraging words. God doesn't care about yesterday. He cares about today and tomorrow. It doesn't matter what's happened in your past. He accepts you for who you are right now. And he will listen. If we will draw near to him, he will draw near to us. He is there. He is like our, he he is our heavenly father. And when I think about that term, heavenly father, God, our heavenly father, I think about what Jesus said. You remember what Jesus said? That we can come to our heavenly father and we can crawl up into his laps because he is our Abba father. He is our daddy. And what daddy doesn't want to hold their child in their lap? And God is there to hold you in his lap, to love on you no, no matter the past. Let me tell you, some of us in here have some past. And God says, climb on up into my lap. I am here. I am listening. 
So let me give you a few quick ideas of help you in your prayer life when it comes to spiritual warfare and just prayer in general. One of the things that I do is I write out my prayers. I don't do this every day and I don't do it all the time, but on circum circumstances, I keep a prayer journal. And when I have something that I'm praying about, I write down my prayers. And sometimes my prayer journal is this, is this big and sometimes it's this long. But I can write down my prayers. And when I write down my prayers, it helps me think through what I really want to ask or say to God. And then I can go back and look at that prayer journal and say, wow, look what you did at this point on this date. So write down your prayers. I think it will help you stay focused. Number two, I think we should pray the same way that you talk to your spouse or your loved one. Listen, nowhere in the Bible does it say pray big words or to pray loudly. Jesus just wants us to talk to him. And I talk to God the same way that I talk to Connie. I don't use these and thous. You know what I do? I say, God, thanks for today. And I just talk to him like he's my best friend because he is. Number three, keep your prayers simple. That's easy, isn't it? <laughs> no. Some of us make them so convoluted. Keep your prayers simple. I think of Peter when Jesus was out on the water and he, they thought they saw a ghost and they recognized, hey, that's Jesus. And what does Peter do? He says, can I come? And, God, and Jesus says, come. And when he came, what happened? He saw the wind and he saw the waves and then he begins to sink. And what was his prayer? Lord, help me. Three words. That was enough. It was simple. While prayer is a conversation that happens throughout the day, we should also find, and this is the number next, find a special place to pray. Maybe it's on the back patio. Maybe it's on the deck. Maybe it's out on the water. I don't know. Wherever it is, find that special place where you can get alone with God. Keep your prayers relevant. If God has laid something on your heart, pray about that something. There's no need for us to dump everything on God. Listen, God can handle it. You can dump it all and he can handle it, but we don't. So if God has laid something on our heart, keep relevant. If Satan is attacking you, pray about that attack. If your friend is lost, pray for that lost friend. If your family member needs healing you pray for healing but you don't need to just dump everything because it really doesn't do us any good what we need to do is we need to be relevant talking to God about this special thing at this special time and listen I think it'll make it more real to you take time to pray maybe I should have started with that one Set aside that special place and that special time on a daily basis to pray. And then keep it. Protect it. Don't let anything get in the way of it. And listen, I know that we, there is so, so much more that we could talk about when it comes to prayer. But, but I think in the context of spiritual warfare, what we need to do is we need to pray for our protection and that he will use us to rescue those around us. We need to pray on that spiritual armor. And my prayer for this whole series is that you know now what piece of armor is, what it's used for and what it is and, and how to use it. And then I pray that through our series that you understand that prayer is what gives that armor its en energy. It's what gives it the power to protect you in these times. That you would clothe yourself daily with God's armor and that you would pray in his strength and in his might. Next week, we start a series on the Holy Spirit and the, the fruit of the Spirit. And I so look forward because so many of us are confused with the Holy Spirit and who he is and what his role is and what the, the fruit of the Spirit is. And so I look forward talking about that over the next several weeks. And I pray you will be as well. Let's pray together. Father, 
we thank you that we can come to you in prayer. Thank you that your door is always open, that no matter what our past is, whatever, no matter what we've done at some point in the past, that you forgive and you're there and you don't move. And you tell us to draw near to you, to submit to you, to be put under place, to put put in place underneath your protection, your provision, your love, your strength, your power. And I pray, God, that as we leave this place, that Hollybrook Baptist Church would be known as a people of prayer. Thank you for being our God and our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Just as I Let's all practice being prayer warriors this week and let's watch the devil flee. Uh, we thank you for being here this morning, whether you're online or in person. And I hope that you'll come back next week and start our series about the Holy Spirit. Brother Jason, will you sing us out? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace in the Good morning, and thank you again for worshiping with Hollybook Baptist Church online this morning. Uh, through the message today, I'm sure you got to hear the gospel message. The gospel message is really the good news of how Jesus has saved us. And those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus, we have a future and a hope for tomorrow. And maybe you've got some questions, maybe something that was said in the message this morning got you thinking, and if so, we'd love to talk to you. You're welcome to contact us through our Facebook page, online, uh, through our website, or even call the church office. Any of us would love to talk to you. You know, the greatest privilege I have as a pastor is to share the love of God with others, and I pray through the message today, you've got a sense of how much God loves you. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you soon in person. God bless.